Well, maybe I'm not going to thank uh, our, our colleagues for uh, inviting me here because it's, it's created a lot of work for me. Um, I'm a lawyer in the room, and I am not someone who is widely knowledgeable about career psychology and the like. However, by now I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a thought of mine and uh, show you some shamelessly stolen data. And uh, the, the key things I'm going to talk about are um, focusing on variation in meta-analyses. And I mean really the size of the variance. I'm going to talk just briefly about the benefits of using theory in guiding your meta-analysis. And my chapter goes into detail about a couple of other techniques for doing that. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about one that's built on a framework uh, that was originally developed by Kronbach for evaluation studies. And I'm using my shamelessly stolen data from Ryan's dissertation. So the, as you've heard, the meta-analyses that have been done in career counseling have started simple and then begun to look at moderators. So old, old data, Spokane and Oliver, they found a very big effect size, a mean effect of 0.85. And as time passed, that, that whopping effect has kind of dropped off. Our estimates are lower. <clears throat> but then we started to talk about what makes these interventions work. How do they work? Um, what moderators are important? And of course, the five ingredients are, are one great example of that. But one thing that people haven't typically done is to actually estimate the variance that's due to these study features. People try, meta-analysts have tried to explain study features and talk about the amount of variance that's accounted for, but rather than um, doing that, I'm going to propose that we should look at the size of some particular kinds of variance. I'm going to use data from Ryan's dissertation, and I chose the decision-making self-efficacy data set because it was small and I could type it in easily for no reason other than that. Um, the studies, uh, apparently there are many more by now from what we've just heard. Um, so let me just totally absolve myself of any responsibility for the actual findings here. So I want you to get a sense of the technique. Um, all right, so what did she find? What she found was that the mean effect um, in her analysis, which is based on fixed effects modeling, which I won't get into very great detail on, um, was a 0.21, and the effects were heterogeneous. But we don't know how variable they actually were, so we're going to find out. And I can see that this is not the, the slightly modified slide. The confidence interval is supposed to be those two bars and the arrows a little bit out of place, so uh, I, I fiddled with it earlier. but. Anyway, this is my analysis of her data um, using a random effects model. And the mean goes up a little bit. It's 0.33. And the standard deviation that's estimated for the population of effects, this is not the variance of the mean, is 0.46, so almost a half a standard deviation. So I take the data and look at it in this lens. The mean is not different from zero. But there's a really wide distribution of effects, and 95% of those effects would be somewhere between minus 0.6 and 1.2. So that means that you might get a good intervention, and you'll have a whopping big effect, but there are interventions out there that could conceivably hurt you in a big way. Um, on the other hand, all, three quarters of these effects look to be positive. So this is a let's pretend. This is what if the population of effect sizes were normal and we estimated its variance. So, okay, that's good. But what else can we do? Well, I'm going to argue that it's really important to use theory to both guide your meta-analysis and to think about the practice of meta-analysis. And in the case of prior intervention and any other meta-analysis, it's going to buy us some things. And so what are those things? One is that because we can use theory-based models for our outcomes, it gives us more powerful tests. We might actually um, you do directional tests rather than just going, gee, 
I think career intervention ought to work. We might think about the components that a particular theory suggests would be important, and maybe another theory doesn't believe those things are so important, and we can compare them, and maybe that gives us some insight into our theories. Um, so, ways of directly assessing those aspects of our theories. Also, if you use a theory to start out with, then you will have to figure out what hasn't been studied. So, we heard uh, Sue talk about the idea of sort of making the topic bigger and making, making it narrower. Um, well, a lot of times people go, oh, there aren't enough studies. I'll just change my question. I'll make it broader. I see this in my class all the time, and I allow it there because you've got to get your project done. But um, it's a little bit like being driven by what's out there. And that's always dangerous. So I am really more of mind that we should think about what do our theories tell us and let that guide us. And then we'll see, oh, wait a minute, the theory tells us this, but I don't know anything about that because I can't find the studies on that topic. And the last thing is, and what I'm going to talk about today, if we really start with theory, we get some ways of assessing generalizability and asking, do we need more information? Which we probably always do. But, so I'm going to talk today about this thing that I'm calling mutos. Now, any of you who have read Kronbach deeply will know that Kronbach uh, was a really smart guy, and he talked about generalizability, and he essentially came up with this theory of generalization for individual evaluation <coughs> studies. And it had four components. Units, um, treatments, what he called observing operations, which really means measures, and also setting. And for him, it was setting one of them, just one setting, because he was talking about a study. But I'm using these ideas in the context of meta-analysis. The big U is the population of units. The small U is the sample of units, which is essentially going to be what you find in the meta-analysis. And the same thing, T and little t. So like most statisticians, a big T and a small t mean different things to me. <laughs> OK, I'm adding an M for method, because when we get to a meta-analysis, we have studies done in different ways. So what do I do with this, and how does it relate to theory? Well, theory is important because theory can tell us what are the big U's that you want? What are the big T's that you're interested in? What observing operations are appropriate measures of your outcomes? They can help us prioritize. So as mentioned before, different theories might identify different components. Um, we might not find every population of units. In fact, there's been a lot of talk about special populations, about populations that haven't been well studied. So you might very well go out and say, I would like to study the disabled and how career interventions work for disabled populations and be out of luck because they haven't been used very widely with those populations. So if we specify our U's, T's, O's, and S's before we do a meta-analysis, it's going to force us to see what we don't know rather than jiggling around our search question and ending up with something we can actually do a meta-analysis on. So start with a the theory and try to use it. So with M, it's a little different because it doesn't play the same role. Methods are tools for us. And people have done studies in various ways because they believe in randomization or because they can't randomize or whatever. In our work, we don't want to generalize to another study. We want to generalize to practice, to the world out there. And the world isn't a randomized controlled trial. So we use M in a different way because, in fact, what we'd really like to see is that the methods that were used in the studies are irrelevant. Um, Tom Cook has this great phrase, heterogeneous irrelevancies. That means uh, the studies vary in terms of a feature, but it doesn't matter. And so my vote for uh, general meta-analysis was based on the fact that I want to see that variation. Because if I don't see it, I don't know whether it matters or not. And so I'm, I was uh, a little side story on the technical advisory group for the What Works Clearinghouse, which is something that um, the Department of Education used to have in a big way. Now it still exists, but it's smaller. 
And the, at the moment, the zeitgeist was only randomized trials because we know they're better. But the fact is that we don't know that they tell us something different from what a quasi-experiment tells us unless we look. Well, we lost that battle because we were just advisors and not the secretary of the Department of Education. But by now, the What Works Clearinghouse has loosened its criteria, and now they're interested in quasi-experiments. And the same thing is true for the Cochrane Collaboration, which is this big multinational um, collaboration of medical researchers doing evidence-based medicine syntheses. So now everybody's interested in quasi-experiments. So we can say, we told you so. <laughs> All right, so what do we do with this mutex? Well, the first thing we do is we use theory in any way we can to specify our populations of interest. And uh, then we classify the studies that we find. And, and by the way, that first bullet point, that actually um, helps us define inclusion rules and that sort of thing for meta-analysis. Um, and then we're going to do coding, as was discussed before. And so what we're going to do is classify these things um, that are study features according to whether they represent M's or U's or T's or O's. And so there might be features of each one. And I, I eliminated this slide on that because it could take a long time to talk about it. But it might be different features of the subject populations. It might be different aspects of the measures that are used under O, like how long are the tests. Um, what is the format of the test? Is it self-report? Is it other report? All those things relating to O. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the ones that are in, in reddish color. Evaluate diversity in each one of those. M's, U's, T's, O's. And I'll tell you why in a second. We have to assess the heterogeneity of the results overall, like I did, like I showed you, how variable the whole set of studies was. Admittedly, a small set of studies, but we're going to do that. And then in the context of that variability, we're going to look at variability that is due to the M, U, T, O, and S things that we see. Okay. And then at the end, it's up to you, the user, to make a judgment about whether the information that you have connects to your desired domain of inference or application, which Cromat calls star utos. And there's no M there. Remember, we don't generalize to a new study. So, um, let's see. so how do we evaluate this diversity? And this is pretty simplistic right now, but there probably are better ways and, and more, uh, more insightful ways. Uh, I've started with this, and it's about all I can handle for this small data set because I'm no expert. Um, but I look at the number of I look at the number of features per uh, U, T, O, and S, and I look at how diverse they are. The more diverse and numerous the features, um, then the greater we have, uh, the greater potential we have to be able to generalize. If every study that has been collected uses the same outcome measure, we don't know whether the effect is the same for other measures. Okay. So in Ryan's case, in this set of um, career decision-making self-efficacy studies, there were only three measures. The three measures used in eight studies. Now, I don't know these measures, so I called my friends. Actually, I emailed my friends, and my friends said, we've never heard of these things. Well, actually, they said, we recognize one of the measures. And um, the other two they had not heard of. They also, um, then I went out and looked. I did some eight, um, psych info searches for career decision-making self-efficacy, and up popped at least two other measures. So I can now make a judgment even as, as naive as I am about the field, that one, these outcomes aren't very diverse, and two, they aren't fully representative. And so I'm a little concerned about the kind of generalizations I can make based on this set of measures. Now about the variation. Well, we've already analyzed the overall variation, um, and it was mentioned if you don't find any variation, then you could just stop there and say, hey, I think everything agrees, although I'll show you that that's even a little bit risky sometimes. But Ryan's results for decision-making self-efficacy um, varied quite a bit, as you saw. So um, that means we can't make a simple statement about whether career interventions work for that outcome. Um, so 
Now, I'm going to look at the variation due to the one feature that I looked at, which is the outcome measure that was used. And I found out, this is pretty standard technique here, that the measure used relates to the size of the effect. This is a little chi-square test. It's a pretty big result, chi-square of 26.8 with two degrees of freedom is whopping significant. And it explains basically all the variance um, statistically. Um, but now we're going to estimate the variability in the group means. So, what did we see? Well, look at this little fancy picture here. And this picture puts two distributions, like one of them's upside down. Okay, and this is because we may end up putting multiple distributions on here. And so this is the distribution we saw before of the overall set of effects. And then this distribution is the distribution of the means. Now, if the, I don't know, my eye and your eye look at this the same <coughs> way. It looks not quite symmetrical, but the variation in the group means is pretty large. The standard deviation of that um, bottom distribution here is 0.32. The standard deviation up here is about 0.46. So the variance is half of that of the full population, but this is still a lot of variance. So it's not safe to generalize across the measures. Now, with that said, here's my caveat. There really only are only three means here, because there were three measures. So this is, well, let's just say it's not the best estimate in the history of the Earth, because there are only three data points um, going into this variance on the bottom. So on the other hand, I think you get the picture. We're going to look at some ideas and see what the size is of the variance. So a standard analysis would tell us a little bit more. Standard analysis shows there's a funny effect size. This effect size is negative. And so I looked into this. It turns out one study only used something called the self-estimated career management competency scale. It asks people to put themselves into a quartile on decision-making self-efficacy. I can't even imagine how I would know if, let's say, all of us, how good is my decision-making self-efficacy relative to all of you? So it's not surprising to me that this is a weird result just based on my trying to think about how I would answer it. It's clearly different from the others. So I did a sensitivity analysis, and when I dropped out that study, it made a big difference. The new distribution of the seven studies here is now homogeneous, <coughs> and it's, um, I would say, a little safer to generalize. Almost everything turns out positive. But even so, this plausible values interval here, which is where 95% of the effects in the population should lie, is still pretty broad. It goes from 0.23 to about 0.7. So is that the same to you, getting an effect size of 0.23 and getting an effect size of 0.7? Probably not. So there's still some variation here, even though it's not statistically detectable with just seven cases. Yes, we, we need a lot of time for Scott. Hmm? We need a lot of time for Scott. Yes, this is my last slide. <laughs> and so um, actually, I'll go to the very last slide. Um, I'm going to tell you guys there's a very cool thing that you can look at. Um, which is a, a new um, web-based meta-analysis tool that I think is something that could be of interest to the career field. This is in the latest Journal of Counseling Psych um, issue. And then I'll finish by going to the last uh, slide. I think I've said all the things in these summaries. Theory can help us, um, but you guys are starting with a good, at a good place. There are good meta-analyses already. So I'm giving you your mission, and I, I guess I understand more meta-analyses are already underway. So should you choose to accept it, pursue meta-analyses that are guided by theory and focus on variation. And this is your mission, but these slides won't self-destruct in five seconds, and you can contact me at Becker at FSU if you're interested in further conversation. Thank you.